Um, so in this session, we're, we're going to focus more on, on the rail side, and in particular um, with, our, with our guests from Kansas City Southern. Uh, first, though, I would like to invite our in-person uh, expert and guest who's going to join the panel. Uh, many of you have met and seen him already, Dennis Manns from North Motor Group. Thank you, Dennis. You want to come and join us? Dennis, of course, uh, had a long career at American Honda, both on the sales side as well as uh, latterly in, in vehicle logistics and is, is working very actively in the industry and we'll talk about it, but has recently played quite a key role in some projects in Mexico as well. Uh, and of course, for our, for our other guests, I'm sure many of you have been following the twists and turns of uh, certain mergers and acquisitions happening. Uh, first with Canadian Pacific, then with Canadian National, then again with Canadian Pacific. It looks like we're on track now, um, but we'll, we'll certainly, I'm sure, touch on that. Um, and there's a, a lot of interesting things happening uh, even beyond the, the, the acquisition. There was recently a, um, a vehicle terminal that we've learned about in, in Bayeo, which would be very relevant for automotive, and um, Kansas City Southern is such an important player in the, in the, in the Mexican market as well. So we're very pleased. Uh, that, that we can uh, have, have this high-level guest join us. He, uh, he, he spent several years as a CFO in, in, in other companies, joined Kansas City Southern in, in 2006, has led sales and marketing, was also CFO, and since 2016 is CEO and president. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome virtually uh, Pat, Pat Ottensmeyer from Kansas City Southern. Pat, thank you so much for joining us here. Thank you very much. Uh, Pleased to join. I, uh, uh, even though we have a nice day here, I'm sure it's uh, much nicer in Newport Beach. So I wish I was there with all of you, but uh, happy to, to join virtually. And uh, Dennis, good to see you. Hey, Pat. Well, we're, 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 we're very pleased you can still connect, connect with us. And it is a beautiful day, uh, but it's really even a better day to talk about talk about rail in North America and Kansas City Southern. So I think we're going to kick off. Pat's got some, some slides uh, to kind of set the scene a little bit here. So we'll, we'll bring those up, spend a few minutes on that, and then, and then we'll have Q&A. And again, we'll, we'll, we'll be open for questions from the audience as well. So Pat, I'm going to hand over to you. OK, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to go through these slides uh, fairly quickly, leave as much time as, as we can for questions. Um, we'll go through the forward-looking statements. I'm not going to uh, read everything that's on these pages. I uh, think the, you can go through these at your leisure if you want to. Uh, why don't we go to slide four, which is uh, the first map in the, in the presentation materials. So uh, this is uh, what the combined uh, Canadian Pacific Kansas City Southern Rail Network will look like. Uh, you can see this is a, a very interesting North American rail footprint. This will be the first of, of uh, first ever truly North American integrated uh, single line rail network. And that notion of single line service, you see it here on the slide, is very important. Uh, as many of you know, I'm sure the um, the, <clears throat> the the fewer times you hand off between carriers. Uh, uh, the, the more likely you're going to get better outcomes in terms of service and cost and reduce damage and all of those kinds of things. So uh, we think the, uh, this, this network here uh, connects some of the most, uh, uh, the largest and most in significant and fastest growing uh, industrial markets, certainly uh, the markets in central Mexico uh, to uh, major markets across the continent um, I think it's significant to look at the port coverage that we have. I, I, I like to think of this as a five port strategy. Um, you can, uh, thinking about the, uh, the ocean carriers, uh, bring a container or bring a, car, a, a product into North America uh, at a port in the east coast of Canada, uh, move it to its initial destination, perhaps move it around the continent. Uh, uh, picking up uh, opportunities for loads uh, across North America and move it out uh, on the same rail network uh, from a completely different coast uh, across the continent. So uh, we think this is going to offer a lot of interesting uh, options for our customers uh, and particularly in the intermodal and automotive space. Uh, not only do we think we can uh, participate in the growth opportunities for North America, 
but we believe we can help drive investment uh, to this network because of the unique single line service that we're going to be able to offer. I think the, um, uh, the opportunities for North America, and uh, I've, I've talked a lot about this over the last uh, few years, with the passage of USMCA, the removal of uncertainty about NAFTA and the trade relationship between the three countries, uh, coupled with other things that are happening that you all are very familiar with, with uh, uh, changes, we're, we're seeing them happen. We're hearing a lot about them. The data supports that global supply chain leaders and strategies are looking more to de-risk and shrink global supply chains. The pandemic has certainly taught us a lot of lessons. Uh, and uh, we could talk for, I'm sure, the rest of the day about supply chain issues. But um, that coupled with the uh, trade certainty of USMCA, uh, I think uh, is, uh, it creates a, 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 just a phenomenal opportunity for North America. And uh, the timing of this transaction, I believe, couldn't, couldn't uh, be better uh, to position us for, uh, for growth in, uh, as a result of all of those trends. A lot of work to do on USMCA. There's no doubt about that. Very, very uh, encouraged and pleased to see the North American Leaders Summit scheduled for next week. I was in Mexico for the last three days and had a chance to engage with uh, leaders, uh, uh, government leaders in Mexico. I, I, I met with the new U.S. ambassador to, uh, to Mexico, uh, uh, Ken Salazar, uh, and uh, I think next week will be hopefully a big week. Uh, there will be opportunities for private sector engagement with the uh, delegations that are coming from all three countries to uh, uh, hopefully uh, resolve some issues and, and set, uh, set us on a path where uh, we, can, uh, we can begin to see clearly how to realize this opportunity for North America. Uh, next slide I, I, is, is fairly um, similar to, to the previous in terms of the map, <clears throat> but you know, if you look at uh, the auto industry in North America, uh, this network is going to be uh, extremely well positioned. Uh, we know it well on the Mexican side. Uh, automotive, as we define it in our business unit uh, uh, definitions, is only finished vehicles. Uh, but when we look at all of the other products, intermodal auto parts, uh, steel, other components, plastics, glass even for, for sand and other products, uh, we think automotive, uh, the auto industry uh, in the day, uh, certainly uh, today is not uh, the best time to take a snapshot of, of that activity, but represented pretty close to 20% of our annual car loads and it was growing and, and there's still opportunity for growth in Mexico. And for us, there's, there's opportunities for growth in market share. Uh, and uh, the project that uh, you saw us announce uh, a couple of weeks ago, if you move to the next slide, is really intended to uh, offer uh, an opportunity to Im for improved service uh, for uh, producers, uh, automotive uh, producers in the uh, central uh, Mexico Bajio region, uh, which is a, a very large market, uh, to facilitate getting those uh, uh, vehicles that uh, produced at plants uh, that we may not touch directly. Uh, to get them on the railroad, to move them into the United States or to the ports, uh, in, uh, a, a, but across the border over Laredo, uh, oriented into markets that, uh, uh, large consumer markets in the southeast and the eastern half of the United States and Canada. Uh, and uh, we think uh, the long-term strategy here is to uh, offer a service offering to, to, to customers that uh, uh, could result in significantly improved asset, uh, asset availability and, um, and uh, uh, consistency and reliability of service. Uh, so move to the final slide here and then I'll wrap up and uh, open, open it up for Q&A or invite Dennis perhaps. Dennis has been a critical uh, factor in pulling all of the parties here on this uh, vehicle distribution center together. Uh, so I might invite Dennis to make a, a couple of comments just about this, uh, this facility. Dennis, as, as, as you know from the introduction, um, has uh, extensive uh, knowledge and experience in uh, not only North America, but particularly Mexico uh, and the Mexican automotive uh, footprint uh, and, and distribution networks. Uh, so 
we, we think this is going to be a very interesting and attractive uh, 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 facility for, uh, for auto producers in Mexico. And again, Dennis, I don't know if, I, if you want to say anything uh, in addition to that about this particular project. Uh, thanks, Pat. I, I mean, it, it's, um, it's a great facility. Um, most of what all of us do here in this room is about partnerships. And, and to be honest, it's a great alignment of partnerships. Uh, uh, KCS obviously is a, a fantastic partner to have on this and, and the other partners that are involved in this project. But, um, you know, for, for the industry, the, the location is just phenomenal. Uh, I, I think it's going to be a solution for a number of people in the room, a number of people in the industry, because it's it's one of those things that has so many different variables put in there that's going to enhance um, the shipments of products uh, throughout the region uh, between Mexico, U.S., and beyond. And uh, so for KCS, I think it's going to be a huge success, and, 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 and all the partners and, and suppliers that are, uh, I think, going to be included in, in this um, opportunity. So. Um, it's an exciting, I think it's an exciting project. I was, I was happy to be able to participate, so. Great, uh, absolutely. Well, well, thank you, thank you, Pat, for, for that overview, and, and uh, there's a number of points there that we're gonna drill into a bit more in, in the Q&A, but I just wanted to start with that, that small matter that you're referring to, 20,000 miles of, of track across the continent, that's about 8.7 billion revenue when you combine it. Um, first true North American railroad. Um, can we drill down a little bit into the automotive side of where you see the most impact for vehicle, vehicle services? I think you referred to some integrations and single line tracks. Where, where, where do you see it most relevant for OEMs? Well, I think the, the, this concept of single line service, uh, again, the, the, the importance of that is uh, uh, lining up the the, the operating philosophy, the capital, the long-term capital investment of Canadian Pacific and KCS uh, to create new competitive single line options that, uh, that don't exist today. I think customers and shippers are, are very interested in those options. Uh, it's a huge freight market. It's a huge automotive market. And, uh, and I think, uh, you know, the investment uh, plan that we have laid out uh, in our 4,000 page merger application. If anyone is interested, uh, you can go to the STB website and read our 4,000 page merger application, which describes our uh, capital investment plan uh, that, uh, that, is, uh, that we believe is gonna be necessary to support uh, the growth and the revenue synergies that uh, we have also described in the merger application. But um, uh, that, that improved coordination uh, will result in better service reliability and consistency, better recoverability. And, uh, and I think, uh, again, I, I, from my sense in talking to our customers, they are definitely interested in new options. Uh, there are other options, obviously. Uh, we're, we're, uh, we're involved on the Mexican side and a lot of the automotive movements, both parts and, and finished vehicles. But uh, I think uh, uh, shippers are definitely interested in new uh, options, new rail options. Um, in the intermodal space, a lot of our growth uh, forecast is targeted to truck to rail conversion. And, uh, and again, the investment plan that we've laid out will support that. Uh, <clears throat> and I think you know, there's, there's opportunities there for, because it is this catchment area between Central Mexico, over Laredo, up through the heart, uh, you know, the, uh, the I-35 corridor up through Kansas City, and then in the Midwest, if you uh, uh, visualize the map that I showed you earlier, uh, from Kansas City north, we go to Minneapolis and Western Canada, and uh, Chicago, Detroit, Toronto, and Eastern Canada. So there's, uh, there's enough freight on the highways uh, in that catchment area for all of us. Uh, to thrive, and um, when you add to that the, uh, the the safety and environmental climate benefits of rail uh, versus truck, uh, I won't go into that, but I think everybody probably understands that rail is significantly more fuel efficient uh, than truck, and that's uh, obviously a, a, a factor that's uh, that's very important to our customers. So. Um, uh, we, we think all of that uh, will, will add up to a, 
a service offering uh, connecting these markets that's going to be very attractive to to shippers and, and customers. If I can jump in for one yeah, quick sure, second, I sure. mean, uh, I mean, this, this is uh, such a great uh, merger here. You, you have two great railroads that obviously have their own independent space and own uh, <coughs> independent. Uh, strengths and what have you, and, and uh, CP is a great railroad, KCS, and, and the two of these coming together, I mean, for, for shippers across uh, our industry, I mean, exponentially, you're just going to see a, a, a massive benefits across the board. So, I mean, this is, uh, for, the, uh, for all of us within this industry, this is a great opportunity. I haven't read the, the report yet. Uh, I'm waiting for the film version. But <laughs> just to, to shortcut maybe slightly where some of the capital investment um, in terms of network capacity, because clearly I think with the automotive industry, what I always want to know from the railroads is, you know, um, what about capacity and, 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 and that side. So are there, are there, where, where do you see some of that capital investment, particularly in that merger, benefiting automotive, Pat? Is it in that corridor that you mentioned, or is it other, other parts of the network too? I, I, yes, in that corridor, specifically uh, Chicago uh, down to Kansas City on the on the CP network, and a little bit uh, from the Quad Cities. Uh, if uh, you know the the, the 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 route will be from Kansas City, kind of uh, uh, north easterly to the Quad Cities, uh, the uh, the border of Iowa and uh, Illinois. And then their network kind of splits off into a bit of a Y, uh, with one uh, one arm of that going uh, north into Minnesota and Western Canada, and the other going uh, east, uh, Chicago, Detroit, and Toronto. Most of the capital investment will be in that uh, uh, Quad Cities to Kansas City on the CP, and then Kansas City down to the U.S. Gulf, specifically down to about Shreveport, Beaumont area, uh, and um, uh, th that, that's where most of the most of the capital investment is planned. Uh, but there is a capital uh, investment that's going to be into Texas toward the border. Now we have our own. This is not in the 275 million that's been described in the in the merger application uh, in that first uh, three-year period. Uh, specifically related to merger integration and pursuing the growth that we see. Uh, KCS independently has a plan to build a second span bridge uh, over the, uh, the Rio Grande between Nuevo Laredo and Laredo, Texas. We have approval for that on the U.S. side. Uh, we're uh, pursuing approval on the Mexican side. Uh, we think that we could possibly start uh, start construction uh, before the end of next year and into 2023. But that uh, that second bridge certainly is going to add a tremendous amount of capacity and improved consistency and reliability. That, that bridge, as you can imagine, given the enormous growth that we have seen over the last few years and expect in the future, that single line bridge at Laredo, Nuevo Laredo, is a significant bottleneck and uh, and this second uh, second span uh, will create capacity for many years and decades to uh, to, to come. Absolutely. Well, as, as as anyone who knows the automotive industry, that, those those geographies clearly are uh, really the backbone of, of the of the supply chain when it comes to, to the production side, and clearly for, for implications for for outbound there too. Um, Dennis, maybe you know, as we talked about, you worked many years in, 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 in the industry on the shipper side too, uh, launched a plant out of Mexico. Um, you know, we talked a lot at the time of, of different challenges, whether it was rail interchanges in Celaya or, or other, other aspects. When you see this merger now, um, you know, what parts would you most want to see, you know, improved, invested in to, to help relieve some of the service issues we've had? Well, again, to begin with, these are both great railroads independently at the beginning, and that's that's what makes this merger that much better because it takes the strengths of both of them, uh, and and so, and we're, and and whether you're an OEM shipper or a supplier of components or whatever, uh, you're going to be the benefactor of everything that brings it. And and what Pat was pointing out is it's going to expand the options to uh, their network, which is frankly our network. Um, 
You know, I mean, equipment is always one of those discussion things that comes up, but, and, and that's, you know, one of the reasons, frankly, you know, um, uh, the Bahia region um, project was kind of introduced is, is to create uh, a, a multitude of options for shippers in that area, inbound and outbound. Because, uh, I mean, uh, that, you know, if you were to throw a dart at the map to, to identify the primary piece of property to enhance the network in that part of, the, of, of Mexico, that's where the dart's going to uh, uh, land. And, and so, uh, and for KCS, uh, they're going to be a huge benefactor because there's, there's going to be so many uh, uh, shippers that are going to utilize that facility. Uh, and, and, um, and, and the name of the game is protect the freight, keep the velocity going, keep it moving to help uh, uh, um, avoid some of the issues that we all encounter with our, 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 our Mexico-based uh, operations. But uh, uh, it's, uh, those are kind of the issues I see and the opportunities. And, uh, uh, but, but I think there's a lot of positivity with, with everything that's being tabled. So. And, and, and Pat, um, I mean, we know this in the forward-looking statements without having to read the detail that, that things are subject to, you know, to change here. But w what sort of timelines are, are, we, are we actually at now with the merger? I, I think there's a shareholder vote coming up quite soon. Obviously, there's regulatory approvals that need to come. But, but roughly, how, where are we on track, no pun intended, uh, for, for this to arrive? Uh, well, the, the important uh, uh, factor in that is, uh, as you uh, may remember, we uh, did receive uh, STB approval in the United States for the, uh, the first step of the two-step transaction, which is the closing into the voting trust. Uh, there were four key uh, elements, uh, five including uh, uh, STB approval, which has uh, already been obtained. Uh, we received a, uh, a, an approval yesterday in Mexico from uh, the Mexican equivalent of the FCC that had to do with some of our telecommunications licenses. We are awaiting uh, approval in Mexico from the COFASE, the Mexican Antitrust uh, Agency. Uh, we don't really see any antitrust issues. Can uh, CP doesn't uh, operate in Mexico. They don't come any closer to Mexico than Kansas City. So uh, we are very confident that uh, that, that process will result in an approval. And then there are the two shareholder groups. Uh, CP's shareholder meeting is scheduled for December 8th. Ours is uh, set for December 10th. So as soon as uh, uh, those three remaining approvals, uh, which we believe will be in December before the end of the year, uh, that uh, then, then the first part of the transaction would take place, which, is what, that, which would result in uh, Kansas City Southern being acquired by Canadian Pacific, uh, we would become a wholly owned subsidiary, but we would be put in trust and I would continue to run the company independently while we pursue the merger uh, approval. And uh, the STB has come out with a timeline uh, after we, we filed our merger, our 4,000 page merger application on October 29th. The STB has come out with a timeline for their review that we believe will result in an approval, a decision in approval in the fourth quarter of next year. So that's, uh, at, and at that point, uh, CP would be able to fully control Kansas City Southern and the two railroads would be merged and integrated. And, uh, and then that process uh, uh, would be the, you know, day one of the, of the merge company. Okay, so again, quite a, quite a, some ways complex, but seems to be on track from that side. Um, we are open for questions, so if there's anyone from the audience who, who obviously would like to uh, ask a question, just, just put up your hand, and, and I, um, I will, of course, relay it. Well, Pat will hear it, even though he can't see you. Um, but I, I wanted to, you know, I, I think as you alluded to earlier, Pat, we could and have been for days here talking about supply chain disruptions and lots of the issues that that the, the industry is facing at the moment. From, from Kansas City Southern's perspective, in terms of your network service levels, how, how it's been impacted up to now, and, and more importantly, you know, what the next trajectory is in terms of uh, end of Q4 into Q1, Q2, um, how, how, do you, how is the, the, rail, the railroad recovering on this path? And, and you know, a bit of, bit of visibility on that for our, for our audience would be great. 
You know, um, I'll, I'll start with the, the good news. Uh, maybe we don't need to talk about the path and what we what we did to get here. I think our service levels right now are a are, are, are very high level. Uh, I uh, We had a small group uh, dinner in Mexico City on, on Monday of, of this week with a good cross section of our industrial, our, 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 our customer base, including automotive, intermodal, uh, one of the uh, largest uh, ocean carriers, uh, consumer products, uh, um, you know, really steel, grain, uh, a really good cross section of customers, major customers in Mexico and cross border. Uh, and, the, uh, and the feedback that we have gotten, and certainly the data supports this. If you look at high level data like velocity and dwell, you look at trip plan, trip plan compliance, other things that, uh, that we track very closely and some that we report publicly, our service has improved dramatically over the last uh, two or three months. Uh, but we had a, a number of, uh, of issues, uh, some relating to COVID, the, the way the COVID uh, health uh, mandates were managed in Mexico uh, was challenging uh, and, uh, and other considerations that you know, we probably don't need to go into. And we've had some revenue uh, issues, revenue hand, headwinds that uh, we, we believe are transitory. Uh, definition of transitory seems to uh, expand uh, as time moves on from maybe three or four months to six months to maybe 12 months, uh, uh, looking out specifically at some of the auto and, and the chip shortages. But even when you when we listen, and I know this has probably been a topic of uh, of interesting conversation and debate at your conference. When we talk to our customers, you know, I don't know that anybody has really good uh, line of sight on when this is going to, to, to be resolved. We believe that it will be resolved. These markets will recover and we want to be prepared when it does. During the third quarter, you can look at our financial results for the third quarter. We didn't have a horrible quarter. We had revenue misses from some of the transitory issues that, uh, that I mentioned, including automotive, but we had good growth in other, other markets. Uh, we added cost in the quarter because we, we put uh, equipment and resources and people in place to make sure that we cleared out our congestion and we got our service levels back to where we, we felt they needed to be to keep our current, you know, our customer base happy and be positioned to growth. Uh, some of you may have heard on uh, investor calls and, and earnings calls. I coined uh, some time ago I, a, a little uh, that uh, that is uh, service begets growth. We know, and we think we have very good visibility uh, to the the oversized growth opportunities that we have in our mix of business. I believe those growth opportunities are there, uh, but it's a matter of us maintaining a, uh, an appropriate level of service, particularly with respect to consistency and reliability. If we can do that, I know we can grow. So again, I feel, feel very good about our service right now and, uh, and we'll continue to, uh, to make sure that we have the resources in place we're completing some important capital projects around the Monterey area that will really relieve congestion in that in that area uh, and others. A uh, long list of, of, of individual discrete capital projects that uh, that are going to help us when these markets recover. Uh, we'll be ready to go. One, not that it's um, uh, relevant to the the, uh, the people in the audience, but uh, we had a fantastic year or a month. I'm sorry, month in the in the month of October record levels of cross-border grain. The significance of that is if you look at our, our grain network, uh, those grain trains uh, that move from the upper Midwest deep into Mexico, Mexico City, um, run basically across every segment of our network. So the number of grain trains that we can run uh, on a monthly basis or weekly or whatever measurement period you wanna pick is really a good uh, headline uh, barometer of, of how our network is performing across our entire network. And, uh, and I will sell the, the, the asset turns, the cycle times, the asset utilization, 
that we produced in, in grain for the last several weeks has, has been uh, at all-time high levels. Can, can I jump yeah, in please. here? They, they, and, and just to kind of piggyback on Pat's comments and to kind of talk about uh, everybody that we have here at the conference this week is, um, I, I think the worst is behind us. Our SAR went up last month slightly, but you know we had consecutive months, several months in a row where the SAR was on a downward streak. Uh, but it did up tick for last month. And um, now coming out of this is still gonna continue to be painful and, and it's not gonna be a steep climb, but we are headed back. And, and so from an, if, if you're in the, on the OEM side of the business, I think you have to look out a little bit further and look at your supplier base. And, and I think if it, if it was me, I would wanna be a little bit selfish and start to protect myself uh, as we come out of this thing and make sure my supplier base uh, is strong, is solid, and can be there to support us as we come out. And, and so, um, you know, we talked about the Bahio project, which is kind of an innovative concept uh, for, for our discussion at the moment. Uh, but also for these OEMs, you're going to have to be innovative and creative to protect yourself as we come out of this thing. And uh, uh, you're going to have to step up a little bit, to be honest. It's going to be it's going to be painful, but this is one of the most difficult situations we've ever been in. And if you don't take care of it, it's going to prolong some of these issues. So important messages there about working together, but also I think what, what Pat referred to uh, in, in, in investment and cost resource that needed to be added there, and obviously that, that, that's sort of critical. If I can just pick up on that point quickly though, Pat, you know, we, and we've been talking about this event, the, the great resignation, the labor shortages, all, all these issues that are clearly in the wider economy. Um, and how much of a challenge has that been for Kansas City Southern, and particularly where you've added resource more recently, uh, you know, was, was that coming at higher cost to maintain and do that than it would have been before? Uh, to some extent, and then in our case, you know, not to address it, uh, you know, the fact that we've got a merger, we're, we're going to be acquired, has added uh, always, uh, even though this is an end-to-end -end merger and uh, it's really focused on growth, there isn't overlapping operations, there, there will be no facilities that, are, that are, we're planning to close, no routes that we will be uh, 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 terminating and, and really minimal uh, headcount reduction uh, that probably is going to be uh, 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 more than accounted for with, uh, with attrition and turnover. Nonetheless, you know, we, in, the, in, the, in the core sort of railroad operations, uh, engineers, conductors, the people who actually move the trains, what we've seen is um, uh, higher turnover in the training classes as we went out and tried to recruit and train new hires and, and get them into service. A uh, higher frequency of people who were not completing the training, which adds cost and time, obviously, uh, that you have to replace them. So we've uh, we've had to kind of overshoot the target a little bit to make sure that we get the numbers that we need to cover growth and attrition across our network. Uh, we've seen, you know, the uh, the great ex. Uh, what, what, what you? How did you refer to it? The uh, the great Wait, termination or great you know, just job turnover, worthlessness. <laughs> Uh, you know, we, we were able to put in place as a result of the merger uh, retention and severance programs to employees to try to keep them calm and protect them and keep them in place to work through the uh, this prolonged period of uncertainty. Uh, but nonetheless, in some of the professional uh, IT, accounting, finance, uh, we've had higher than normal turnover in some of those areas. But uh, so far, we haven't had uh, difficulties replacing those, those people, but uh, you know, there's no doubt the hiring process, particularly given the training, length of time it takes in our business to get uh, people trained and in service uh, has, uh, has, has, has prolonged and, and added cost to the whole process. Great, um, uh, if you have a few more minutes, I mean, I'm running slightly over, do you have a few more minutes, Pat? Just, uh... yeah, 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 great. Yeah. Um, you, you referred to, uh, you know, 
challenges with the Mexican government in some aspects of, of the pandemic, but, but looking a bit more widely in terms of where, what you'd like to see uh, in terms of how the governments in North America can help and support uh, the growth of the rail, railroads and obviously the common objectives, of course, of, of you know, reducing emissions, for example. But what, 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 what changes do you, would you sort of need, see uh, needing to happen on the political side? And I realize that can be a dangerous point to raise, but um, it, would be, it would be great to hear some examples. <laughs> Did, did you ask me if I had a few minutes or a few hours? <laughs> we'll take as long as you, you know, can. Said, there's, a, there's a lot of work to be done on the implementation of USMCA. And, and <clears throat> I hope I'm not, uh, you know, uh, uh, overestimating the, uh, the, the, uh, the impact of the North American Leaders Summit. I think it's significant uh, to get uh, the, the leaders and their delegations engaged. I, I believe that there will be opportunities for private sector, we need it. Uh, so for those of you out there that uh, are involved in engaging with your government leaders at all levels, please uh, keep your voices elevated because now is the moment, I think, to, to really try to uh, move this in the right direction so that we can hopefully get beyond some of the skirmishes that seem to have slowed down or uh, diverted the progress and uh, and get all three countries, the leaders in all three countries, to realize that uh, we, we all have a great opportunity to win here. Um, but, uh, but, but that's going to require uh, active uh, uh, speaking up on the private sector engagement where, where that's possible. And I will admit, I'm, I'm the, the, the U.S. chair of an organization called the U.S.-Mexico CEO Dialogue. Um, my guess is uh, many of your, your uh, uh, audience are uh, involved in that as well on, on either side of the border. Uh, and, um, and that has been in the past a, a, a valuable sounding board uh, with the government uh, sector, uh, particularly through the high level economic dialogue, which was just reestablished. I think that's a positive sign. And, um, and, and I'm certainly going to be pushing and, and asking for support from other private sector leaders. Uh, to engage and make sure that uh, that we move this in in the right direction to get the best outcomes for all of North America, as opposed to getting uh, kind of bogged down in some of the the uh, the more detailed points that just are are going to prevent that from happening. And of course, uh, USMCA is going to require uh, more active engagement because of the sunset provision that's built into this agreement. I think that's a good thing. Uh, maybe we won't uh, make the same mistake we did with NAFTA, which is kind of put it on the shelf and and uh, and not really work it as our economies and and uh, and businesses changed. So um, if you see opportunities to engage uh, with public uh, government leaders to make sure they know what's important, um, please uh, please do so because I think we are at kind of a critical point. I'm very hopeful, certainly. Uh, that uh, the North American Leaders Summit and all of the activity taking place around that uh, is is going to uh, be helpful in maybe accelerating the pace of, of of coming to some important agreements. I think it's a key key message, and I would echo and encourage obviously anyone who you know can engage with their local representatives, perhaps especially <clears throat> the OEM side. I'm sure the I'm sure the voices can be. Can obviously are better heard in unison, and particularly from from larger companies like that. Was there something you wanted to add there, then? No, no, no. Okay. Um, maybe a, a, another question. Oh, we have a question here in the audience. We're going to take a, an audience question. If we can just grab a mic there. It's a Thomas. Yeah, good Thank nation. You. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, hello, hello. Yeah, it's on. I'm I'm frequent uh, a guy asking questions, but. Uh, my question is actually regarding rail and um, changes in, uh, in, in the vehicles, uh, especially EV vehicles with heavier weights. Uh, my question is how is uh, CP, KC uh, looking at uh, changing um, the rail uh, wagons for that? Is there, is there any changes that are considered in that respect? Or is it going to affect the utilization of the rail wagons? Uh, why this is relevant is, is just because of the volume flows from Mexico to US and Canada and getting more and EV vehicles being produced in Mexico uh, that might impact uh, efficiency of, of rail as well as it does on the tracking side. Would you have something similar as we saw today 
on the track utilization for different manufacturers uh, that will give us uh, a perspective on how rail is looking at, at the storage factors on, on the rail wagons uh, because that will have an impact between uh, choosing on the rail or, or short sea in that specific trade lane between Mexico, US and Canada. Thank you. I, I think I heard most of that, but it, it, the question basically is what, 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 how are we going to fulfill the equipment needs uh, for the heavier EV vehicles that uh, are likely to be, you know, a larger part of the market going forward? Yes, that's correct. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think there are things you can do with the existing multi-level fleets. Uh, certainly the, the capacity of each rail car is, uh, is, is going to be lower than, uh, than would be the case for different type of vehicles, uh, traditional vehicles. But I know that there's a lot of work going on with the rail car manufacturers and the railroads and through uh, AAR and, and uh, developing some standards for, uh, for making sure that we, um, we, we understand what's going to be required and, uh, and are ahead of, of, uh, uh, ahead of the market, so to speak, so that uh, we don't miss that opportunity. But there, there definitely is work that needs to be done and there will be investment required for the existing rail car fleet and then perhaps uh, uh, at some point uh, different rail cars that would be specific to uh, electric vehicles. Okay, thank you for that. Um, maybe another question from, from my side and um, for you to comment on as well, Dennis, because I know you're, you're a systems guy. But um, starting with, with Pat, in terms of say digitalization, for, for, for railroads um, in terms of areas of opportunity, perhaps a, a part of the merger too in terms of investing and updating systems. I know it's a broad, a broad aspect, but is that, is that a key focus for, for the railroad now moving forward? Yeah, it is. I think one of the maybe misunderstood things about the rail industry is uh, uh, not uh, perhaps perceived as being technologically advanced, uh, which I don't really think is the case at all. There's so much you could pick up a hundred white papers or research reports from Wall Street or think tanks or consulting companies about um, aut autonomous vehicles. And uh, probably 95 of them would be about trucks and cars and, and probably not even five on, on rail. But uh, you know, the, the US rail industry has spent uh, something like $16 billion developing something called positive train control. Positive train control is a safety initiative uh, it's uh, not necessarily the, the technology that the railroads would have chosen to uh, invest, but it was a federal mandate. It's been implemented across the U.S. And uh, it is a uh, very uh, useful springboard into running a more autonomous rail network. Uh, in addition to that, and I think the, the, the path, the theoretical, uh, for what this is worth, the theoretical path uh, from a technology standpoint of, uh, of being able to run an autonomous rail network is shorter than, uh, than it would be for uh, the passenger vehicles and trucks. Think about the fact that we run an entirely private network. And if we were to develop that technology, we could, uh, we could insist that all of, the, all of the trains on the network are, uh, have that capability where that's gonna be a long, long time before you have that on the highways. In addition to that, there's a, just a tremendous amount of really interesting technology on, uh, uh, on, on reliability of equipment, uh, mechanical, detecting mechanical failures before they occur, eliminating derailments or, or uh, equipment failures that cause congestion and, and uh, service delays and cargo damage. Uh, all of those things are moving along at a really rapid pace. And uh, we're taking advantage of, of a lot of those, as is CP. And, uh, and a, a part of the investment, in addition to the capital investment that I described, there's $175 million in post-merger uh, IT investment that will advance all of these concepts and, uh, and, and really uh, help us uh, run a more efficient network. The advantage, and you will never hear us talk about driverless trains, so the use of uh, higher use of automation in managing our rail network, uh, I think the, the real benefit there, perhaps there, there is a labor uh, benefit at some point, but uh, the, the real benefit would be the additional capacity that would be uh, created 
without the investment in traditional ways of track ties and, and ballast, uh, using technology to run a more uh, intelligent, efficient, uh, reliable rail network, I believe would free up substantial additional capacity with the fixed network that we have today. Thanks very much. Uh, maybe Dennis, just briefly to add, is there, uh, you know, again for, from your experience, what what are the sort of e -er, key areas of the system side you think that would benefit the railways really to, to digitalize? Um, I mean, first and foremost, I'm a big rail supporter. You know, that's how we ship most of our stuff across the United States. And and at the at the at the start and the end of the journey is is your opportunities for improvement. And um, and so from an OEM standpoint, you go from the pin to the VIN, and, and if you get it on its journey fairly quickly, you've, you've taken away half your problems in your life. And now we get to the end of the journey, and that's the other uh, opportunity there. But, um, you know, the system thing is changing rapidly. I mean, we have so many different system providers in this room, and, and each one of them offers something rich and robust with their own individual world for the OEMs and suppliers to, to um, better understand how their network is operating. And, and, I, and I look at those systems that are available today compared to five years ago, 10 years ago, and, and, and again, it's so much uh, better. Um, and, and, and if you have the information, you have the data, you're gonna be able to make better decisions to address your network. And, and, and that's the name of the game. That's the name. Your, your whole network most of the time does really well. It, again, it's that, uh, that uh, the one end of your uh, bell curve is, is the one you got to deal with. That's the ones everybody focuses on. But with great systems, that helps you manage that end of the bell curve. Okay, fantastic. Well, I, I appreciate it. It's, it's getting on lunchtime here in California, so, um, you know, I don't want to carry on too, but maybe we'll just finish with the last question um, for, for both, starting with you, you Pat. Um, Obviously, this merger is 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 a kickoff for a key transformation for the company and now the companies. Um, and what's your vision for a, a railway that's really fit for purpose uh, for our changing economy and automotive industry, looking more long term? So let's say more towards the end of the decade, 2030. Um, what what what's the real key points for you for that for that fit for purpose modern railway? I think it's uh, the highest level of consistent, reliable service, uh, uh, and, and certainly uh, climate is going to be an important part of uh, the, the, the choices that, uh, that our customers make. Um, now, you know, I'll just say, and I don't want to go too far down this, uh, this cul-de-sac here, but, you know, head-to-head -head with existing uh, fuel sources and technologies, rail is far superior to truck. We are working on other alternatives. We, we realize that we've got to uh, look beyond uh, the status quo and, and, and develop uh, alternative sources, and, and we're doing that, but that's, uh, that's, that's going to be a longer-term proposition. But I really think it's running the most efficient network, eliminating those handoff points, that, that concept of single-line service in a most, uh, the safest, uh, most climate, uh, environmentally reliable uh, way we can. And, um, and I think uh, that is really what's going to win in the marketplace, and that's really what this merger is all about. Great. Thank you, Pat. Dennis, what, what would you, what, what, what's your thoughts? Just quick 30 seconds. It, it, to me, it's communication and dialogue. Things happen. Everybody in this room does a great job, but even with all the efforts we all do, things happen. And, and, and just like um, the value with doing this conference, face-to-face -face as to both virtual. Virtual was nice considering what we... But you, you learn so much and you can dialogue with so many people that you need to in this. Having Pat, frankly, uh, love to have you here, Pat, mm -hmm. but understand, but the virtual thing, he realizes how important the automotive part is to his business and, and, uh, and, and, and Pat or his staff or, or different representatives within our, our industry, um, communication, dialogue to get over some of the hurdles that we all face. Excellent. And Christopher, yeah. if I could just, Please. sorry, I don't want to, I don't want to trump Dennis here, but, uh, <laughs> you know, as you think about fit for purpose for the uh, North American finished vehicle logistics, uh, take a look at that map again at the very beginning. This network is fit for purpose for the uh, automotive logistics uh, uh, system in, in North America. Mm. So 
I'm, I'm delighted. I wish I was in Newport Beach, but I'm delighted to be able to participate and look forward to uh, uh, future uh, in-person participation. And as do we, Pat, but we really do appreciate the time and insight that you, that you took. We know the schedule is certainly busy. And it's been very valuable, uh, especially at this time with this merger happening, to, to get some of these insights direct. And I, I do think it's a great statement uh, to show the, the strategic importance of automotive for both Kansas City Southern today, but certainly for the, in the post-merger uh, as well. So very much, very great thanks to you and, of course, to Dennis for joining and, and Dennis for your help in, in connecting us with Pat, too. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Dana. Hyundai Glovis' mission is to make the world better connected by maximizing customer value. Every day, we are making the world an ever smaller place and increasing customer value. Your value chain partner, this is.